Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our program today. Uh, I hope everyone is staying both healthy and cool in these warmer days. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesbees. I am the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Today we'll hear about Senator Joe McCarthy, one of the most notorious members of the Senate in American history. McCarthy was a tireless worker, a genuine war, and a genuine war hero. His ambitions knew few limits, neither did his socializing, his drinking, nor his gambling. When he made it to the Senate, he flailed around in search of an agenda. Um, finally, after three years, he hit upon anti-communism by recklessly charging treason against everyone from George Marshall to much of the State Department, he became the most influential and controversial man in America. His chaotic meteoric rise is a, a gripping and terrifying object lesson, yet his equally sudden fall from fame offers reason for hope. Speaking to us today, we have two experts. Larry Tai is a New York Times bestselling author whose latest book, Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy, was just released two weeks ago. Uh, it is based on Ty's first ever review of McCarthy's personal and professional papers, medical and military records, and recently unsealed transcripts of his closed door congressional hearings. Larry Ty is the author of seven pre previous books, and from 1986 to 2001 was an award winning reporter at the Boston Globe. He will be joined by Donald Ritchie, historian emeritus of the U.S. Senate. When Mr. Ritchie uh, stepped down, after nearly 40 years with the Senate, Senators Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid delivered speeches uh, commending his career. A Capitol Hill newspaper noted that it was the only time the two leaders had agreed on anything. He joined the Senate Historical Office in 1976 and there conducted an oral history program and provided research and reference for senators in the media. He also prepared for publication the closed door hearings of Senator Joseph McCarthy, releasing nearly 9,000 pages of records. Um, if people have questions about the program, uh, they can contact me or Sarah Bertulli, our public programs coordinator, uh, at programs at masshist.org. There's also the link for the Mass uh, Historical Society's website there. Um, I would also point out that the Massachusetts Historical Society has a very active roster of, of programs planned. We have programs planned throughout uh, the rest of, of 2020, uh, which will all uh, be on Zoom. Um, we're providing these programs uh, for free during this unusual time, uh, but we do this uh, through the support of our donors and members. If you are not a member of the Massachusetts Historical Society, but you appreciate our work and would like to continue to hear programs like this, I hope you'll consider joining um, or making a donation to support us. You can find more information about that at masshist.org support. I'd like to um, welcome our speakers, uh, Larry Tai and Donald Ritchie, who um, can now uh, turn on their videos um, and unmute themselves. There we are. So uh, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining us and uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who have read some of Larry Tai's other books, his other biographies in particular, and probably his uh, book about the liberal icon, Robert Kennedy, which was uh, a very impressive book to me that really began to peel between the images of the good Bobby and the, the bad Bobby. But I think they'd be probably surprised that you made this leap from doing Robert Kennedy to doing Joe McCarthy. And I wondered if you could explain to us how you got from point A to point Z. Sure. So th there are two people that I would blame for making that leap. One is a woman um, one of 450 people that I interviewed for the Bobby Kennedy book, and that is uh, Bobby's widow, Ethel. And Ethel Kennedy said something that I find kind of, uh, found kind of extraordinary. She said that while to much of America, Joe McCarthy might have been a monster, to the Kennedys, he was actually just plain good fun. And the idea of Joe McCarthy as good fun seems so counterintuitive and jolting to me. And the idea that Ethel Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy, who I think of still as the ultimate liberal icons in recent American history, were raving about Joe McCarthy and that Bobby actually got his political start with Joe McCarthy, I found really surprising and interesting. Um, the other person I blame for my writing this book is you, Don Ritchie, <laughs> because for since I first met you in the course of doing the Bobby Kennedy book, uh, 
um, you had been telling me about this extraordinary trove of papers that were out there on Joe McCarthy. And those are the transcripts of his closed door hearings, the hearings that show us Joe McCarthy unmasked. And you were the one who unmasked those transcripts after 50 years of their being behind closed doors along with the hearings. And those transcripts, I thought, were basis enough to give me a sense and hopefully readers a sense that there was a side to the Joe McCarthy story, despite 25 biographies and 100 books indirectly about him, there was more to say and more revealing. The one last factor that led me to write the book was the election of 2016. A week before the election, I had signed up to write a biography of Barack Obama. And the week after the election, I realized not just that we wouldn't understand Barack Obama's legacy until the end of the era of Trump, but that suddenly the Joe McCarthy story was a story about more than ancient history. It was the story of today. Well, your experience in discovering that there was the different sides to Joe McCarthy sort of paralleled my experiences in interviewing some of the Senate staff who worked with him. And I, quite frankly, was shocked that people thought highly of him. They liked him. They remembered good old Joe as the fellow that uh, gave them Christmas presents and slapped them on the back and lent money to the Capitol policeman and things like that. It seems so contradictory to his public image. So I wondered if you could give a little description of who Joe McCarthy was. What, what kind of a person was he and what, uh, what did you discover about him? Sure. So I think Joe McCarthy was um, all the bad things that we've associated with Joe McCarthy, only even worse. But there was an upside to him as well. He was somebody who could grill witnesses for an entire day to the point where they were totally destroyed and then invite them out and mean it for a beer that night because he assumed that it was all just a game and that you should understand the rules of the game. And the rules of the game said, everybody goes barefisted when they're in public, but in private, they can be friendly, they can be gentlemen, they can be whatever. And I think that Joe McCarthy was um, all the things that Ethel Kennedy said to the voters of Wisconsin when they voted him into office overwhelmingly twice. This was a state that didn't just have a history of a very conservative streak, but it was also one of the most progressive states in America, even back in the 1940s and 50s. And Joe McCarthy convinced Wisconsin twice uh, that he was worthy of being elected. He also convinced America by 1954 that 50% of America told the Gallup polled that they thought that Joe McCarthy was a great guy. And that made him the second most popular person at that moment, trailing only the incredibly popular post-war war hero, President Dwight Eisenhower. But if that was Joe McCarthy sort of appealing to the best instincts and, and showing his charisma, there was also the Joe McCarthy that I want to just... Um, capture the, the, um, the evil Joe McCarthy and the opportunistic Joe McCarthy by telling a really quick story of the first office that Joe McCarthy ever ran for. And that was when he was a law student at Marquette University, and he was running for president of his law school class. And he was running against a really affable guy named Charlie Curran. And they made what they called the gentleman's agreement that each of them would vote for the other. It was unseemly to have to be elected um, if, if you depended on your own vote. So they agreed that they'd vote for the other one, and they did that in the first round. And the, the round ended up in a dead tie. For the second round, Joe McCarthy won by two votes. He won by Charlie Curran's vote for him and his vote for himself. And when Curran got outraged after that and said, how could you do this? You made a promise. McCarthy said, I was out there telling people to vote for the best man. And how could I do anything other than do that? And that was Joe McCarthy at his most opportunistic. And that was a sense of what we were going to get for his public career until his death. 
Well, there have been a number of historians who've written about Joe McCarthy, but not before those records of the Senate were opened up to show his closed hearings. And not also, well, to, they couldn't look at his personal records because they've been sealed up in Marquette University since his death. You're the first scholar to go in there to look at those records. What did McCarthy's own papers tell you about him? What surprised you? So again, there were things that made him look better. And I want to tell you one quick story about that. The story is that Joe McCarthy, when he first ran for Senate in an unsuccessful race, he dubbed himself Tail Gunner Joe. He was the perfect war hero, he said, coming back from the South Pacific. And he would do for America and Wisconsin what he had done for us overseas. Uh, he ran for office that way. And his Tail Gunner Joe moniker ended up being a caricature. The press didn't believe he was a true war hero. The public ended up not believing it. And NBC News did an entire hour-long documentary making fun of him, calling him Tail Gunner Joe. Well, it turns out that we can now see his real-time records um, that he kept, a handwritten diary when he was in his island in the South Pacific. And they document every flight that he took as a tail gunner. His actual assignment was as a land-based intelligence agent, but he went up and volunteered for these flights. He came under enemy fire, and we don't have to trust only his diaries. Those files that were under lock and key also show records from his squad mates saying, I took him up, and he was, I was the pilot, and he was my tail gunner, and he did all of these volunteering for these missions. So the truth is he was a war hero. The truth is if you lie as much as Joe McCarthy did in his life, when you're finally telling the truth about something like your war records, nobody will believe you. But we now know that that is something that we should believe. But if that was Joe McCarthy at his best, the hearings that you unsealed, Don, and the files at Marquette also show this more sinister side of Joe McCarthy. They show that when the doors were shut in the hearing room and nobody was there other than his staff and the witness, he became even more of a snarling senator. Any notion that witnesses deserved any rights went out the window. He treated them like they were guilty. He also used those closed door hearings as a way of testing out what the witness was like. Witnesses that stood up to him and that were eloquent never made it into public sessions. Witnesses that caved to him and were his patsies, he loved bringing out in front of the public and in front of the cameras. Those closed doors showed that he conducted one man hearings in violation of Senate tradition. And one last thing those hearings showed is that in the morning, he looked pretty reasonable. And in the afternoon, he became very irritable and would jump on witnesses. And Don, you and I, I think, both concluded that that was because during lunch, he had a hamburger, he had a raw onion, and he had plenty of whiskey. And that he was actually inebriated in the afternoon. And one of the sets of records that I got access to was his medical files from Bethesda Naval Hospital, and they confirmed his increasing consumption of alcohol, which was a matter of speculation and is now a matter of fact. Yes, his uh, tone was very different from witnesses. In the morning, he was quite solicitous often. In the afternoon, he would hector and, and badger them. Well, uh, McCarthy uh, has sort of been immortalized by the fact that his name is associated with McCarthyism. And I wondered if you think that uh, McCarthy, well, did McCarthy actually create McCarthyism? And could you explain a little bit about that? So McCarthy created McCarthyism. He didn't create the Red Scare. The Red Scare was there in the late 1930s with the House Un-American Activities Committee. But the guy who ran that for a long time was not nearly the charismatic figure that Joe McCarthy was, or it would be called Dyeism, named after Martin Dyes. Joe McCarthy was late to the hunt for Reds 
and he was less effective than Dyes and most everybody who came before him, but he was enough of a spellbinding character that we associate the Red Scare generally and this whole movement of reckless accusation with Joe McCarthy. And if again, I could tell one quick story about where the birth of his crusade and the birth of McCarthyism, the moment that that began. And it began in February of 1950 on what is for Republicans a famous occasion every year. It's on the birthday of Abraham Lincoln where Republicans around the country gather and have fundraisers and they toast some celebrity in their party. And if you were a famous senator or you were the president, you would be invited to the Lincoln Day dinner in a place like New York or Washington, in Boston or San Francisco. When you were Joe McCarthy, a backbencher and looking like you were gonna be a one-termer, you got invited to a not famous place called Wheeling, West Virginia. And McCarthy showed up there that night as the Lincoln Day dinner speaker with a big briefcase that contained two speeches. One speech was a snoozer on national housing policy. That was something he actually knew something about, but had he delivered that speech that night in 1950, 70 years later, we would definitely not be here talking about Joe McCarthy. Instead, he reached into his briefcase, picked out the other speech, which was a barn burner on a topic that he knew very little about. And it was a topic of anti-communism. And he waved in the air in his hand a piece of paper saying, I have in my hand a list of 205 communists at the State Department. They're potential Soviet spies. The president knows about them or ought to know about them, and I'm going to name them and count them. Now, you could see what I have in my hand here is something that you cannot tell. It could be <laughs> the menu that I ate for lunch today, or it could be a list of 205 communists. Nobody ever got to see the papers that Joe McCarthy held that night either. But it became front page news that he was naming spies and counting them. And within two days, he was on page one in every newspaper in America. McCarthyism, or at least his crusade against communism, was born. So was the fact that he was an opportunist and a fraud. And he never turned back. Well, since that time, the, we know a lot more because of the Project Venona, which opened. And some of McCarthy's defenders these days have pointed to Venona, which was a uh, decrypting of uh, Soviet spies during the 1940s that the federal government was finally able to break. And they say, well, aha, there were spies in Washington. Wasn't McCarthy right? Uh, has McCarthy been vindicated by subsequent information? So Venona vindicated the fact that there were spies. Um, the government was in fact decoding information from them in real time as McCarthy was taking off on his crusade. But what Venona confirms is not that McCarthy was right. Venona confirms that the 24 carat spies were long gone by the time Joe McCarthy got there. That the ultimate expert on Venona is a guy named John Haynes. And John Haynes did a wonderful comparison for himself and later on for me, comparing the Venona list with the McCarthy naming of names. And we find that there were nine names that were on Venona that Joe McCarthy had named, but even most of them were low level people. Most of the people that Joe McCarthy named were in fact union organizers or other minor figures. And somebody said, and they meant it as a joke, and I think it actually bears a lot of truth, is that Joe McCarthy could have been dropped into Red Square on May Day and not recognized a communist. And it does not say that there weren't spies. It does not say that the Soviet threat wasn't real back then because there were spies and there was a real threat. It just says that Joe McCarthy wasn't the guy to catch those spies. That's right. The... Uh because the J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI was annoyed that uh, McCarthy was making it look like his agency wasn't doing its job. Uh, and uh, the federal government had started uh, loyalty programs in 1947, three years before McCarthy began his movement. What was Harry Truman's role in all of this? 
Um, so another name that the movement could have been named after if it hadn't been named after Joe McCarthy is Truman. Some people have suggested that Trumanism would have been a fairer name because Harry Truman, while he was a good guy in lots of ways, was out there with a loyalty program that was much, much harsher than he believed should be instituted. But his response to Joe McCarthy, um, history books often tell us, was standing up to him and calling him a fraud. I think that's giving Harry Truman much too much credit. I think his response to Joe McCarthy was developing a program that subjected every federal employee or every federal applicant for a job to a very harsh scrutiny. And any ones that had any suspicion at all were subjected to FBI investigations. And it wasn't that he was turning up people, it's that he was protecting his hind. And I think that it worked as protection, it didn't work in rooting out communists, and it sure as heck didn't work in taking down Joe McCarthy, because Joe McCarthy got the better of Harry Truman much more than Truman did of McCarthy. Hmm. I was very taken by the, by the first sentence in your book, which is, this is a book about America's love affair with bullies. What was it about bullying that was, that was so attractive in McCarthy and in other politicians? So from the very beginning of American history, there is a uniquely American strain of demagoguery. And it's the same appeal that demagogues have in Germany and in Italy and Russia and in Brazil. It is that the public has certain legitimate fears, and the fear in McCarthy's day was the fear of the Soviet empire. The complicated solutions of actually how you respond to that with Truman's Marshall Plan, with other intricate programs, gets to be boring. And it's much more interesting to come along and say, I'm going to root out spies. It's our State Department that's a problem as much as what's going on in the Soviet Union, and I'm going to make you safe. And at a moment when we had recently seen exposed the Rosenberg atomic spies, at a moment when China was going from nationalist China to red China, at a moment when we were getting ready to tell kids in classrooms across the country that the response to an atomic bomb should be what we called duck and cover, go under your desk and put your hands over your head. At a moment like that, there was a real fear and Joe McCarthy gave what sounded like a compelling answer. That's the same thing that Huey Long and the jubating uh, radio preacher, Charles Coughlin, and the racist Senator uh, Bilbo, people like that had done it before Joe McCarthy. People like uh, the Senator from Alabama, George Wallace, and David Duke, the KKK leader, would do it after Joe McCarthy. What Joe McCarthy did better than anyone was associate himself with that movement he lasted longer than most of those other demagogues, and therefore he became the archetype of the bully or demagogue in American history. Mm -hmm. Now, he also had a top aide who's also looked upon as a bully, and that was Roy Cohen. Could you explain what his role was in all of this? Yes. So Joe McCarthy in 1953, when the Republicans took control in the Eisenhower landslide, they take control of the Senate. Joe McCarthy goes from being a gadfly to the chair of a very powerful committee and subcommittee, and he needs a chief of staff. And he looks at two guys. One guy is a brilliant and arrogant New York lawyer who had proven himself a successful prosecutor of communists named Roy Cohn. And Roy Cohn had a number of things going for him. I said he was brilliant. He was, as I said, arrogant. And he was also Jewish. And at a moment when Joe McCarthy was being accused in many quarters, I think with some legitimacy of being an anti-Semite, Roy Cohn gave Joe McCarthy the fig leaf. I have a Jew as a top staffer. How could I be an anti-Semite? The other guy who was up for that job was a guy that we started talking about a while ago named Bobby Kennedy. And Joe Kennedy had called Joe McCarthy um, when Bobby was graduating from law school and said, my son needs a job. Joe Kennedy had given enough money to Joe McCarthy that when Joe Kennedy called, Joe McCarthy tried to do what Joe Kennedy said. And Bobby Kennedy uh, 
in his first meaningful job that lasted a full six months, went to work for Joe McCarthy in the number two slot. We could ask a matter of history and we can speculate anything we want. What might have happened instead of Joe McCarthy being defined by Roy Cohn, who reinforced every bad instinct that Joe McCarthy had, what would have happened if Bobby Kennedy had been the top staffer? Would Bobby Kennedy have taken Joe McCarthy on the same ride or would he have calmed him down? And the answer is we will never know. But the other answer is that was a very different Bobby Kennedy back then. He was a cold warrior. He believed in everything Joe McCarthy was doing. And he remained Joe McCarthy's loyal friend and showed up at his funeral, even when big brother Jack said, stay away. Oh, I had a chance to talk to one of the staff of the committee, Ruth Watt, who talked very fondly about Joe McCarthy. But she said, you know, whenever they turned the TV cameras on, he just lost all control of himself. And I wondered, what's the role of the media in all of this? The, you know, McCarthy was obviously a media master in many ways, but did the media play into his hand? So it did. But I want to just say one thing. I think Ruth Watts' interview that you did with her was incredibly helpful to me for two books, and she was really smart. But as you and I know, he went more out of control when the cameras were <laughs> off. And that was counterintuitive that a guy... Most politicians go crazy when the press is there taking down every word and when the public's there watching. Why Joe McCarthy went more wild, I don't know, but I think that maybe it was the drink, maybe it was something else. But I think that the, um, remind me, the question again was... was what was the role of the media? Well, oh, the media's role. The so as a lifelong reporter, I'm embarrassed to admit the role of the media. And the media at the beginning was Joe McCarthy's huge enabler. The media repeated, became the megaphone for all the phony charges that he was throwing out there. The media let him get away with releasing his charges every day just before deadline so that the responses to the charges would show up on page 24 a day later, whereas the charges themselves would be the day after McCarthy had thrown them out there and they'd be on page one. Joe McCarthy knew perfectly how to play the media. When he initially released his incredible charge of 205 commies at the State Department, he did that in Wheeling, West Virginia, where he knew that the only reporters would, who would be there were some out-of-the-way AP reporter and the reporter for the Wheeling Intelligence or Newspaper. They wouldn't know who to call in the State Department to get the other side. And again, he did it as a dinner speech when there was no time to really get the other side. Joe McCarthy learned that if you were going to release something controversial, don't do it in Washington, do it somewhere out in the Bergs where you're going to get any reporter that happens to be there that day. And that's how the first charges will be repeated. The media was, as I said, his enabler but there are exceptions. And one exception was a guy who doesn't get anywhere near the credit, and he will get that credit when Don Ritchie writes the brilliant biography, which is now being reviewed. And that is a guy named Andrew Drew Pearson, the most popular, the most widely read columnist, an incredibly popular radio commentator. And he took on Joe McCarthy early. He took him on hard. He wrote something like 60 columns in the wake of the Wheeling speech, and he paid two prices for that. One was getting physically accosted when Joe McCarthy ran into him at a supper club, and if it hadn't been for the peace-loving Quaker Richard Nixon getting in between them, the Drew Pearson might have been seriously hurt. And the other was Joe McCarthy brilliantly went after his sponsors and told the public that loved him not to buy the Adam hats that were the ultimate sponsor for Drew Pearson. Adam Hatt withdrew the sponsorship, and Joe McCarthy knew how to charm reporters, and he knew how to punish them. And if any of this sounds familiar, we'll talk about that later. But the right. Yes. Uh, it, interesting that, uh, that uh, uh, Richard Nixon loved to tell that story in the later years, and he would always say, and did it do me any good in Pearson's column? No, never. <laughs> Sorry. Now, 
it, it, McCarthy went after all sorts of agencies. He went after the USIA. He went after um, the, the, the government printing office. I mean, just run down the line of government agencies, including the State Department, that he targeted. But uh, he also went after the United States Army, which was quite remarkable considering that the sitting president of the United States had spent his entire career uh, in the Army. And this brings up Eisenhower. And I wanted to know, where do you see Eisenhower fitting into the, the McCarthy story? So more legitimate historians, people who are true historical scholars have for years given Eisenhower um, credit for quietly bringing down Joe McCarthy. Uh, they called it his hidden hand, that he wasn't just this doddering grandfather type who was out playing golf every day, that he was orchestrating behind the scenes lots of important things, including the downfall of Joe McCarthy. Um, I call it the empty glove, not the hidden hand, that in fact Eisenhower is given a free pass and doesn't deserve it. For more than a year of his presidency, when Ike's brother Milton was whispering in his ear, saying, give up some of your enormous popularity to take on that bully, Joe McCarthy. Eisenhower didn't do it. Eisenhower said, McCarthy will do himself in, and we ought to wait for that. And that would have been a really smart strategic move if McCarthy weren't destroying lives in the meantime. So for the most destructive period of McCarthy's career, from his assumption of the chairmanship of his subcommittee in the start of 1953 to the Army McCarthy hearings in 1954, Eisenhower did next to nothing. And the only thing that finally gave him the backbone was when McCarthy took on an enemy that was too big to bully, namely the U.S. Army. And finally, the general stood up and finally their commander in chief stood up and he went from being enabler in chief to McCarthy slayer that people give him credit for being that he wasn't at the beginning. And one last thing, his ultimate act of cowardice, in my mind, was not attacking Joe McCarthy as he had planned to in a speech when he was campaigning for president after McCarthy went after his great World War II buddy, General George C. Marshall, a true hero in the war, a hero as Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State, and according to Joe McCarthy, the ultimate traitor. Eisenhower was going to give that speech. His aides told him not to. He didn't. And I'm convinced one of the few things Eisenhower regretted in his public career was not at least giving that speech defending his pal Marshall. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the victims of McCarthy? I mean, who are the people who suffered from McCarthy? So I'd like to talk about the victims by telling you about one victim um, who I think was emblematic of what Joe McCarthy did with his victims generally. And it was an engineer at the Voice of America named Ray Kaplan, a, an obscure character who got caught up in McCarthy's drama where he was suggesting that there was a campaign of sabotage in where the Voice of America was locating its radio transmitters and that leftists at The Voice wanted them located at a place that they wouldn't reach as much of the Iron Curtain community that The Voice was trying to go after. And MIT had designed the, the towers and cited them. The Voice of America agreed with that analysis, and stuck in the middle was Ray Kaplan. So one day, just before he's due to testify before McCarthy, Kaplan goes to MIT to visit the engineers to make sure they would back up that he hadn't done anything wrong, which he hadn't. He couldn't find the engineers. He got panicked. And when he was leaving MIT, a, an enormous truck was going by on Massachusetts Avenue near the main entrance to MIT. The truck driver slowed down when it saw this guy nearing the crosswalk. He darted out in front of the truck and was killed. The coroner ruled it a clear case of suicide, and the suicide note that Ray Kaplan left behind said to his wife and young son, I just want you to know I would have been cleared. I did nothing wrong, but I couldn't take the pressure. Fifty years later, 
I find this guy at the Voice of America, this retired guy from the Voice of America named George Jacobs, who was Kaplan's supervisor. And Jacobs was a smart guy. And he said, anytime somebody kills himself, there's all kinds of nuance. Maybe Ray Kaplan was a little depressed. He had some things going on in his life. But he said, and this is the quote that will always stick with me, if there had been no Joe McCarthy, we would have Ray Kaplan. There are a dozen people like that, people who kill themselves because of Joe McCarthy. There are hundreds of people whose careers were ruined by Joe McCarthy. And there are, I am convinced, hundreds of thousands of people who were silenced because of the fear of having a finger pointed to, at them because of McCarthyism. And I think the one thing that communists and anti-communists could both agree on back in that era was that their worst enemy was Joseph Raymond McCarthy. Hmm. Well, the, the Army McCarthy hearings became the, the sort of the, the talisman of that whole period, and people were glued to their TV sets, and it really uh, undermined McCarthy's career because they got to see McCarthy and see him operating for such a period. And of course, he's immediately for the Senate a few months later is censured by the Senate. And they, some of the history stories sort of suggest, well, that was the end. Uh, once Joe McCarthy was censured, McCarthyism was over. What's your take on that? Was McCarthyism over? So my take is that McCarthy went down in the Army McCarthy hearings um, in, that ended in August 1954. He's censured in December 1954, and he dies in 1957. Uh, but clearly, McCarthy was gone. McCarthy was all done, really, after the Army McCarthy hearings. The censure made clear that Congress finally had the guts to do what they should have done before, and, but he was already done in before then. And he died, sadly, of alcoholism. My take is that McCarthyism goes on today. And my take is, and we can talk about this in the Q&A if people want to, my take is um, whatever one thinks of Donald Trump, that Roy Cohn, McCarthy's protege, was in the 1980s Donald Trump's true tutor as he was beginning to go into this cutthroat world of New York real estate. Roy Cohn passed on from Joe McCarthy to Donald Trump all the lessons of how to badger your adversaries, of how to attack the press, of all the lessons of McCarthyism, and that in Washington today, we can see that McCarthyism didn't die with Joe McCarthy. Well, I think that probably is a good point for us to open the floor for discussions because I'm sure that people who have been listening have questions to ask you. Thank you guys both for a very, uh, very informative presentation. Um, so we do have questions. We have one person with our hand raised uh, whose name is Larissa. Hi. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Tai, thank you very much for this. Um, I really look forward to reading your book. Um, I'm a librarian at Harvard University and I've been studying my father. Um, and my father was uh, affected by McCarthyism. He lost his tenure at Rutgers University after pleading the fifth before um, the McCarthy hearings in 1953. And he experienced kind of a double whammy. He had worked at the State Department in the 1930s. And as it turned out, I learned in uh, 2009 that he had indeed been a spy at the State Department. Um, for the KGB, but really the official version was he was anti-Franco during the Spanish Civil War. So what he gave was some scuttlebutt to the anti-Franco forces but he was still busted, but it, his guilt wasn't proven. So then the McCarthy hearings come along in 1953, and he was, you know, he was fingered for being, you know, left-leaning. Um, and he pled the fifth before the uh, committee, and um, the official Rutgers University stance back then was, you plead the fifth before these hearings, you lose your tenure. And uh, that was that. So um, my, my quick question is this, is that the academic community in higher education, this was considered communist infiltration of, of educational institutions nationwide. This was also a component of their um, quote unquote witch hunt. So I was wondering if um, 
during the course of your research, you noticed anything like that in a, you know, higher education, uh, people losing their careers in that way? So they absolutely did. And they did. That was an extraordinary story, by the way. And thank you for it. And I think that um, they did lose their careers. They did it not just at Rutgers. They did it where you work now at Harvard. Uh, the president of Harvard came in as one of the strongest critics of Joe McCarthy. He came, he had been president of a school in Joe McCarthy's hometown of Appleton, Wisconsin. He came to Harvard and there were all kinds of noble ideals. The board, the trustees loved that they had a Joe McCarthy critic as their president. But if you claim the fifth in front of one of McCarthy's committees at Harvard, like at Rutgers, you were almost certainly going to lose your job. And a guy who later became a hero in the Kennedy administration named McGeorge Bundy was the dean at Harvard in those days. And he thought it made sense for people who declared um, the fifth to lose their jobs. And that, to me, is not only a violation of everything the Fifth Amendment stands for, but it's a violation of what academic institutions that supposedly reflect freedom of thought stand for. But Larissa, just one other aspect of your story that I think is emblematic. It sounds like Joe McCarthy actually had before him a true spy, and he didn't really recognize that, that he was upset with your dad for claiming the Fifth and didn't know that he was working for the KGB. Uh, so Robert wrote, uh, McCarthy destroyed the careers of several people. Did any of them successfully sue him and get reparations or vindication? No, because he was a senator, and Don knows the legality of this much better than I do, but he had Senate immunity, and he was perpetually in his battles with Drew Pearson and others saying, I will step off the floor of the Senate and take you on and say my things when I give up my immunity. But he never did that in anything that was really controversial. So he couldn't be sued, or could he have been sued if he lived, Don, and as a private citizen later? Uh, he could be sued. He couldn't be sued for libel because anything he said on the floor was exempt uh, under, the, under the Constitution. But he was sued by Drew Pearson, among other people, right. uh, for, uh, for other events along the way. But um, he, he wasn't. And uh, of course, the Supreme Court waited until after McCarthy died before they reaffirmed that uh, witnesses before congressional committees didn't lose their constitutional rights by testifying. All right, so we have a couple other raised hands. We have Michael. Hello, thanks. Yeah, I was gonna ask uh, your guest, do you see any parallels between McCarthy and uh, Scott Walker, who was a former, recent former governor of Wisconsin? I think both of them were uh, examples of political nightmares that came out of Wisconsin and which, of course, surprised many people who have this uh, false impression that Wisconsin is a great hotbed of progressivism and liberalism. Well, that's partly true, but also there's vast areas of the state where people are the people that elected and reelected McCarthy and re elected and reelected Scott Walker. So do you see any parallels in those situations? So if I ever knew how to keep an answer to one word, I would say the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I, when Joe McCarthy first ran for office, he ran for district attorney, he ran as a Democrat, and he was a flaming New Deal FDR supporter. But he realized, as you say, that there are parts of Wisconsin that a Democrat's never going to be elected. So not only did he change parties, he changed ideology. He went from a liberal Democrat to being what they call in Wisconsin a stalwart Republican, which means the right half of the Republican Party in Wisconsin. He was running against a liberal Republican and the heir of the famous La Follette family, great political titans in Wisconsin. Um, the conservatives were looking for a standard bearer. They didn't want Joe McCarthy, but he was all that they had. And he became a not just a Republican senator from Wisconsin, but he became the political, um, the uh, patron saint of that wing of the party. And that is the wing of the party that Scott Walker represented this many years later. So James wrote, uh, I hope Larry will speak uh, to the uh, ways in which 
uh, McCarthy in was enabled by those far more powerful than he, who found his rantings those of at least for a time a useful idiot, but were the interests of those who were in effect uh, treated McCarthy as their collaborator. Great. So I love the question and I love that he doesn't miss wor mince words. And I think that the, um, he had four kinds of enablers that I want to discuss very, very briefly. One was the wealthy oil tycoons in Texas who bankrolled him once his movement got going. And there were wealthy people other places, but mainly in Texas. A second kind of enabler was, we've already talked about, the media, which gave him a mouthpiece and a megaphone. The third enabler were the politicians, his fellow Republican senators, who when they finally got the majority in 1953, sure as heck weren't going to give it up by taking on one of their own. And the Democrats had seen in the Senate what happened when one of their own stood up against Joe McCarthy. And that was the first one to do that, Millard Tidings in Maryland. He called McCarthy a fraud and a hoax. McCarthy went in and bulldozed him in his re-election campaign. He lost his seat. The message got through to other Democrats and LBJ, for anyone who didn't get the message, said, we are going to wait for Republicans to take him down. We're not going to do it. But the ultimate enabler was us. It is the American people. And that is a lesson, lesson that I think we want to resonate today. We decide whether demogra demagogues can be elected to office and we do decide how long they can stay in office and bully us. And we have the power to decide something else. So uh, we have another person with their hand raised, uh, Mimi. Um, Mimi, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you, Gavin. Um, uh, Larry, I'm in Wisconsin, Kenosha County. It's not too far away from Odigama County, just like uh, um, an hour or so. Um, you know, you talk about the relevance to today, right? Uh, we know, I just read Mary Trump's book on Trump, how his character was formed, when, you know, throughout the growing years. But here in Wisconsin, oh, you know, you know, McCarthy is from a farmer's, um, you know, it's like a blue collar, even below the blue collar family, not wealthy parents. And you know, we were Westerners very down to earth and assuming, and sometimes we are, we don't use a lot of words. We, we, you know, use actions, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, the farm culture, culture here, right? So the, if you talk about the relevance to today, um, where does uh, McCarthy's mendacity and the bulliness and the um, manipulation and demanding loyalty, the similar choice, how, how, where did that uh, uh, come from to him, you know? So great question. And I'm not going to blame his parents. Um, the, we can have lots of um, psychologizing of what led Donald Trump to be Donald Trump, but Joe McCarthy's parents produced a lot of very good, um, the uncontroversial, the um, uh, children, and then they produced Joe McCarthy. And I think where he came from was um, somewhere that nobody today wants to claim credit for, but I think somewhere that is in the stock of America, whether it's in Wisconsin or in my wonderful state of Massachusetts or wherever it is, um, we produce, as we've seen throughout our history, demagogues from the South, from the North, and from the Midwest. And I think that while we can point to the strains of Wisconsin politics that explain pieces of Joe McCarthy, he was a unique human being and his upside and his downside were all about him and not about Wisconsin or anywhere else. Thank you. Um, Don, did you want to add anything to any of these comments? Well, I'm just going to say that there was a crude side to McCarthy that I think appealed to people, that he was a man of the people. He came up from a farming stock. He, he sort of uh, boxed his way through college. And uh, uh, he appealed to uh, a more genteel set who thought that, well, this is the guy who was taking off the gloves and going out and fighting the good fight. And uh, uh, he, he, there was something about him. There was a man of the people image that attracted uh, popular votes to uh, to him. Okay, so um, Jack wrote, uh, 
You mentioned that other demagogues have been compared to McCarthy, uh, like Trump, Wallace, and Long. For many of these other figures, race played or plays a huge role in their hateful rhetoric. What role did race play in McCarthy's politics and in this paranoid style in American politics? Surprisingly little. And that was one of the few, um, the groups that McCarthy didn't try to scapegoat. He, we know he scapegoated people because of their political ideology. He scapegoated people because of their ge geography. He hated Easterners because they were the Eastern elite. He hated West Coasters because they were out of touch. His favorites were the Midwest. He scapegoated people, I think, because of their religion, starting in his earliest days in the Senate when he defended the perpetrators of the bloodiest massacre by Nazis of American troops, um, the famous Malmedy massacre. He scapegoated gays in what was known as the Lavender Scare. He went after just about everybody, but maybe it was in his part of Wisconsin, there weren't enough African-Americans to make them um, a target of his, or I'm not sure why. There were at times different things that he said that suggested he could have been tempted into that as well, but he never went after blacks as far as I know, really. The only exception, really, the, the memorable exception is Annie Lee Moss. Sure. Uh, would you like to say a few words about her? So I'm going to say one word about her, and then you're going to talk about her because you'll do a better job. But Annie Lee Moss um, was the perfect foil, not just for Joe McCarthy, but for his enemies. And she's a really interesting and intricate case. But Don, tell us about Annie Lee Moss. Well, she was a very low-level uh, clerk at the Pentagon, uh, handling uh, crypto uh, documents that she couldn't read. Uh, they, but uh, she had been a cafeteria worker before. The cafeteria union was run by communists at that time. And so there's a question as to whether when she worked in the cafeteria, was she ever a member of the party? She consistently denied that she was. Uh, but uh, she was brought up constantly by uh, various federal agencies, by the House on American Activities Committee, and by McCarthy. And this is one instance where McCarthy's system of interrogating people in private first failed him because she was sick and she couldn't come to a private session. When she showed up for the first time, he met her in a public hearing. He realized right, right away she didn't fit the model that he was going after. And in fact, she made him look bad. And McCarthy unexpectedly stood up and walked out of the hearing in the middle of her testimony. Uh, and so it's one of those odd cases. I've always thought of Annie Lee Moss as a person who's uh, always been considered guilty until proven innocent. And she had to fight constantly during her career to, to maintain her innocence. So I want to just say one other quick thing about her. As patronizing as Joe McCarthy and especially Roy Cohn were towards Annie Lee Moss and the fact that she was a black woman, equally patronizing the lionized Edward R. Murrow, who made her a heroine, he treated in his questioning of her, he treated her like she was an idiot. And she was an exceedingly savvy, um, articulate person. And it was just, there was equal opportunity racism in terms of Annie Lee Moss then. <laughs> um, so Charles has raised his hand, so we're gonna, allow him so charles if you'd like to unmute yourself um fabulous book um what i still don't get is the extraordinary level of trust that mccarthy had in roy Cohn. um he let him participate in questioning he and he let uh Cohn and shine travel around the world in, in, in on investigations um you know, Cohn was this young attorney who, I don't know what he had done before. He was, he worked for the committee, but you know, what did, what hold did Cohn have on McCarthy, if any? I mean, why, why this extraordinary level of trust? So there are conspiracy theories that Roy Cohn knew something about Joe McCarthy that he was holding back. And I only raise those. I don't believe those. But you can't talk about Joe McCarthy and not throw in the words conspiracy theory somewhere. But I think that I think what Roy Cohn had was he understood perfectly 
that at some level, even though Joe McCarthy was an exceedingly smart and savvy guy, and he was the boss, at some level he was had a huge insecurity. And Roy Cohn understood, um, he was eloquent in a way Joe McCarthy was was not. He understood the New York world of power brokers and important press and conservative press in New York that Joe McCarthy didn't. And Roy Cohn offered Joe McCarthy all the things that Joe McCarthy lacked in terms of confidence in himself. And it would take a smarter psychologist than me to figure out exactly what those gaps were. But there was something, I think, at that level and not having dirt on him. Did you want to add anything, Don, or? Uh, no, I, I think it's a very a good uh, description of him. I found uh, Roy Cohen and his friend David Shine to be incredibly self-indulgent people. And uh, this, there are interesting stories in Larry's book about the fact that they wouldn't even work in the Senate office building. They rented a really much nicer space across the street to work out of. And, and in fact, they, ha they were having a ball uh, at this time, and they, they really wound up destroying McCarthy, even as uh, much as he depended on them. So Peter wrote, um, could you speak a minute about Joe McCarthy's non-role in the 1952 Kennedy Lodge Senate election? Right. So one of the counterintuitive things about this arch conservative cold warrior Joe McCarthy was that he, in one way that we've already talked about, in another way that that question suggests, helped launch the iconic liberal Kennedy dynasty. And in 1952, a, an upstart congressman from Massachusetts named Jack Kennedy was running for Senate. And Papa Joe Kennedy said to Joe McCarthy, I'd love you to decline the request of Senator Lodge to come to Massachusetts. Just stay out of the state. You don't have to say nice things about Jack Kennedy. And Joe Kennedy was smart, and he knew that McCarthy had a big following in Massachusetts, especially among Catholic Democrats, and that if he came touting the attributes of Senator Lodge, that could be the margin of victory. Well, Eisenhower won that year by, I think it was nine points in Massachusetts. Kennedy won by three points. Had Joe McCarthy come in, it could have been the margin of victory. So Jack Kennedy... One of the reasons that I think that Jack Kennedy copped out when it came to voting for Joe McCarthy's censure, he said, I have a bad back and I've had surgery and I can't vote. Well, he could have told the public how he would have voted or he could have paired his vote against somebody who was going to vote the other way. He never publicly said how he would have voted. And I think it was the price that he was paying back Joe McCarthy for helping launch his career in the Senate. So we have, uh, I think, time for one last question. Um, Lisa wrote, uh, was there information in McCarthy's personal papers that endeared McCarthy to you? So there was extraordinary information in the personal papers, some of which we've already talked about. But there were um, a couple things that, again, helped humanize him for the better and for the worse. One was his love letters to his wife. And I loved that this tough guy, Joe McCarthy, was at one point very insecure about whether his soon-to-be wife, Jean, really liked him and whether she would go out with him in the early days. And seeing this vulnerable, very human Joe McCarthy was inspiring to me. Um, it also showed Joe McCarthy being the ultimate cynic. Not long before he launched his anti-communist crusade that he would become known for. He was studying the Russian language. He was telling his Russian language teachers that peace with Russia was going to be a defining characteristic of our world. And he was doing exactly the opposite, obviously, of what he made a name for. And the only consistency was doing anything, and I repeat the word anything, that it would take to launch Joe McCarthy where he wanted to go. Uh, I don't know, Don, if you wanted to add anything of, of examples that you found in your work that made McCarthy somewhat endearing. Well, I'm not sure of the word endearing, except that, uh, <laughs> that uh, I, I was struck by how many people who worked on Capitol Hill uh, 
found something good to say about him. I came out of graduate school in which no one in graduate school ever had anything good to say about McCarthy. And it turned out he was a human being. And of course, that's what biographers really have to do is we have to peel beyond the, the, the public images to find out who is there. Uh, McCarthy was an incredibly destructive human being, but he had his human qualities as well. So can I just say two last really quick things? One is I want to put in a pitch for the Mass Historical Society, not just because they ran a great book talk tonight and because they did one for my Bobby Kennedy book, but because they really matter in terms of anything about history. They've got an extraordinary staff and great programs in one of the most beautiful buildings in the country. Um, and the other thing I want to say, and this is more self-promotional, I want to say, I won't tell you to go out and buy my book, but if you want, if you end up doing that and you want a signature plate, we would normally be having a book signing after a book talk. If you want a signature plate, um, Gavin and Sarah will be sending you a note on a great independent bookstore and I will personalize a book to anybody that wants it, if you want that. And I just want to thank Don for giving me this book idea and giving a great um, session of moderating and, and answering questions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both, and thank you for the kind words about the Mass Historical Society. We actually have one last slideshow, or slide to share, which will also have information about where to buy the book. So uh, we were recommending uh, that people support a locally owned bookstore. Uh, the bookstore closest to the Massachusetts Historical Society is called Trident Booksellers. Uh, it's a great place uh, and they have uh, Larry's book in stock. Um, so um, if you can copy this link or uh, we'll include it in an email that we send to you after the program, um, it will take you to their bookstore uh, and where you can buy the book. Uh, and again, uh, Larry has offered to send uh, signatures uh, on signature plates for you to add into the book so you can have a personalized plate. So thank us, everyone for coming uh, and thank you Larry and thank you Don uh, for a wonderful program and I hope everyone has a nice evening. <laughs>